I would like to welcome you to part 6 of this 10-part online training program on adaptive designs and clinical trial simulation. This module, uh, this video, is quite similar to the module on software tools for clinical trial simulation for proof of concept or dose finding trials with response adaptive randomization. This was part 4. In this video, we will go over the steps for designing adaptive trials that support predefined rules for adaptation such as sample size re-estimation or event count re-estimation, which means that we will evaluate the potential advantages of an adaptive design approach in each particular setting, because it's very important to model the patient enrollment process, understand how quickly key pieces of information will become available, to support efficient data-driven decision rules in a general adaptive setting. And this is where a clinical trial simulation comes in, and we'll talk about clinical trial simulation on the next slide. So as in part four, where we talked about software tools for adaptive designs that support dynamic data-driven randomization scheme, here we'll also begin with a quick introduction to clinical trial simulation to software tools for designing adaptive trials with sample size or event count re-estimation. And I'm going to refer throughout this module to the Mediana Designer package that can be downloaded and installed from the CRAN website. Uh, CRAN here stands, by the way, for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. You'll find a detailed description of the uh, relevant statistical methods as well as technical manuals on our website at mediana.us. And uh, additional information, um, a very, I think, helpful online, online manual with several case studies is also available on uh, GitHub, on the GitHub website under Mediana Designer. You will see all of the links on this slide. In addition to directly installing software on your computer, you can also use web applications to design adaptive trials. These applications uh, run in the cloud and they support the same functionality as the R package, the Mediana Designer package that you can download from the CRAN website. And on this slide, you've, you'll find information about the login, how to access the web applications, the login and password for accessing those applications. Let's begin with the software tools for adaptive designs with sample size re-estimation and uh, the case study that will be used in this video. Within the Mediana Designer package, the function that will help us design adaptive trials with data-driven sample size or event count re-estimation is the ADSS mod function. It stands for adaptive design sample size modification. This function supports designs with general rules uh, for futility stopping at the first interim analysis as well as uh, data-driven decisions to increase the sample size or increase the target number of events at the second interim analysis. Or you could launch a local web application with a graphical user interface on your computer. You can do it by calling the ADSS mod app function within the Mediana design package. And this will facilitate the process of specifying the required parameters, such as the treatment effect assumptions and data-driven decision rules in the design. And finally, a technical manual for this particular module, this particular uh, set of uh, functionality is available on our website. You can see the link uh, again at the bottom of the slide. This is the case study that will be used in this module. Uh, it will label it case study A2. There are several case studies available for this module on sample size and event count estimation. The first case study deals with an oncology clinical trial uh, where the primary efficacy analysis is based on time to event endpoint. And this particular case study is based on a real-life phase three trial in patients with acute schizophrenia. The primary endpoint, as I'll show you in a minute, is a continuous normally distributed endpoint. So let's take a closer look at this case study. The following setting will be assumed in this case study. As I said, it is based on a real-life phase 
three study for the treatment of acute schizophrenia. Uh, this is a two-arm trial. A single dose of the experimental treatment will be compared to placebo. This comparison will be based on the following efficacy endpoint. It's the endpoint uh, which is used in all confirmatory clinical trials um, in, uh, the, in the schizophrenia, uh, for, for the schizophrenia indication. This primary efficacy endpoint is defined as the change from baseline to the end of the treatment period at six weeks in the PANS total score. And PANS here stands for the positive and negative syndrome scale. As I emphasized a minute ago, this total score is continuous. Uh, it is assumed to follow a normal distribution. And an important feature of this particular instrument is that a beneficial effect is associated with a reduction. So if we now look at changes from baseline, a larger negative change, a larger reduction would indicate a strong beneficial effect that a, a patient may experience in this clinical trial. A three-stage design with two decision points will be used in this adaptive trial. The first interim analysis will be done to support a futility assessment. Uh, the study will be stopped for futility if the predicted probability of success. At the final analysis, given the results available to the trial sponsor or an external data monitoring committee, at the time of this interim analysis, if this predicted probability of success is not high enough. And um, if there is no evidence uh, to stop the study for futility, the study will continue to the second interim analysis. And at that time, potentially a sample size reestimation rule could be applied. And it will be applied if the predicted probability of success is not sufficiently high. Uh, we will define a, uh, a, a, an interval that uh, we call an underpowered interval. And if the predicted probability of success, uh, conditional power, happens to be within that interval, then a decision will be made to enroll additional patients into the trial to increase the total sample size with the, with the ultimate goal of improving the probability of success. And of course, the last decision point will be the final assessment. Let me now walk you through the process of specifying the required parameters for this function ADSS mod that we will use for simulation based assessments of adaptive designs in this class. Uh, we will use this function to evaluate key characteristics of the adaptive design, proposed adaptive design for uh, the clinical trial with schizophrenia and will support, as I said, both futility assessment at the first interim analysis and sample size reestimation. Of course, the very first step will be to load the Mediana Designer package. Uh, this step is implied. It is not explicitly shown on this slide, and we will uh, continue directly to the process of specifying all of the required parameters for this function. And to be able to do that, we're going to create a new empty list of parameters. It's, it's simply called uh, parameters. And we're going to begin populating it. Uh, and the very first step will be to specify the endpoint type. In this case, the primary efficacy endpoint uh, is expected to follow a normal distribution. Therefore, we set the endpoint type to normal. And when it comes to the direction of favorable outcome, I uh, pointed out earlier that a larger reduction in the PANS total score, which is the primary FX endpoint, uh, indicates a stronger beneficial effect. And that's why this direction parameter will be set to lower. The last parameter shown on the slide is the sample size. It's the number of enrolled patients, not to be confused with the number of evaluable patients that will be ultimately used at the final analysis, for example, that's the number of enrolled patients. In which one of the two arms in this trial? The first number, 200, corresponds to the sample size in the placebo or control arm, and the second one, 200 again, is the number of enrolled patients in the treatment arm. This slide presents the parameters that describe the treatment effect assumptions for the two arms in this uh, clinical trial. Given again the 
distributional assumptions for the primary efficacy endpoints. All we need to do here is to specify the mean value for the control as well as the treatment arm as well as the standard deviation of the primary efficacy endpoint. A common standard deviation, as it is commonly done, is assumed here. Uh, this common standard deviation in the control and treatment arms is set to 25 points on the PANS total score scale. And um, the mean change is expected to be negative 15 in the placebo arm and a larger change of negative uh, 22.5 on average will be expected in the treatment arm. This slide specifies uh, the most important parameter, uh, one of the most important parameters for the adaptive design, the information fraction, as we um, described before. This is the fraction of the sample size at each of the decision points relative to the sample size in terms of the number of available patients, of course, at the final analysis. So four values here need to be specified. Why is that? Because first of all, there are three decision points and then potentially a larger if a sample size could be considered for the final assessment. So looking at the four values, four elements of this uh, uh, vector of four values, the first one, point three, corresponds to the information fraction of 30% at the first interim analysis. At the second interim analysis, uh, the, the information fraction is 0.7, so 70% of, uh, of the total sample size is expected to complete the uh, six-week treatment period. The information fraction for the original final analysis before sample size adjustment will be 1, simply 100%, and the cap on sample size re-estimation Sample size increase here is specified. This cap is 30% of the original total sample size, which means that the information fraction at the final analysis after sample size adjustment uh, is applied could be as high as 1.3. But of course, as we have said um, uh, multiple times before, the beauty of this adaptive approach is that the sample size is not automatically adjusted to the highest possible value. It's more of a sliding scale approach. The sample size is only increased, adjusted uh, as, as necessary. It's just uh, uh, 1.3 is the uh, highest uh, possible value for the information fraction. But in reality, the information fraction at the final analysis after sample size adjustment would be a number between 1 and 1.3. Beginning with the dropout rate, we expect the dropout rate to be fairly high, 20% uh, or 0.2 at the uh, end of the six-week treatment period. I would like to point out that here we don't have to make any explicit assumptions about the patient enrollment process, given that this is a fixed uh, duration study. All of the patients will be followed until the end of the six-week treatment period. And let's now continue to um, a review of uh, the additional required parameters that describe the decision rules, the futility stopping rule, as well as the sample size reestimation rule at the two interim analyses. The first one is the futility threshold. That's a threshold for conditional power that will play, obviously, a key role in the futility assessment at that first, very first decision point. This futility threshold is set to 0.1 or 10%, which means that the study will be terminated for futility if conditional power is below this threshold. The second set of parameters, known as promising or underpowered interval, those define those parameters of 0.5 and 0.9 define the lower and upper limits of this interval. And um, if conditional power at the time of the second interim look happens to be within this interval, then the decision to appropriately increase the sample size will be made, and the original sample size will be retained if conditional power is below 0.5 or if it's greater than 0.9 at the interim analysis. The very last parameter on this slide defines the rule for increasing the sample size. If conditional power happens to be, 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 be between those limits of, again, 0.5 and 0.9, the, 
then the sample size will be increased in such a way that conditional power will go up ideally all the way up to 90%. Uh, this may not always be possible because we've already imposed a cap on the sample size increase. So the target for conditional power when we apply this sample size re-estimation rule will be 90%. We will try to get as close as possible to that target provided the sample size increase does not exceed that cap, which was again 30% of the original total sample size. Uh, two more parameters need to be specified. There's a fairly standard parameters. Uh, the first one is the one-sided alpha level of uh, 0.025 or 2.5%. That is the level of statistical significance, the overall type 1 error rate required in all confirmatory clinical trials. And the second parameter is the number of simulation runs that will be used to compute key operating characteristics of this um, complex adaptive uh, trial. And now to be able to compute those characteristics, all we need to do is to take this list of uh, parameter values. We're going to uh, pass it to the ADSS mod function. It relies on a very efficient simulation engine. It will probably take just a, a few seconds to run the simulations, even though it's a fairly large number of uh, simulations. And the results will be saved to the object called results. Uh, and then uh, the last step would be to create a simulation report. And uh, the simulation report uh, can be easily created, uh, generated by calling the generate report function. We just need to provide um, a copy of the results object and specify the file name for the simulation report. In this case, uh, I chose the file name um, shown at the bottom of the slide, which is case study a uh, uh, x. If you would like to run this R code or make appropriate um, changes that may be consistent with the slightly different design for your adaptive trial, then you can download this code um, as well as a copy of the simulation report uh, that we just, um, I showed you how to generate that simulation report uh, a minute ago. You can download both the R code and the simulation report uh, using the link shown on the slide. The last section of this video deals with a simulation report that was generated by the ADSS mod function. Now I'm going to present a quick summary of this report for this uh, case study. And I'm going to emphasize uh, key operating characteristics of the proposed adaptive design. And we will talk about the role of clinical trial simulation and iterative approach to designing clinical trials uh, with complex features uh, such as complex adaptive decision rules. Here's a screenshot of the title page of the simulation report for this case study in patients with schizophrenia. This report includes all the relevant information about the trial design. Uh, there are 10 tables included in the report. Uh, the first eight tables uh, present the general information about the trial uh, that includes treatment effect assumptions, uh, rules for a design adaptation, and the last two tables uh, summarize the most important operating characteristics of the adaptive design with futility stopping and sample size re-estimation. We will take a closer look at those two tables on the next two slides. The first table, table 9, gives us the probability of the most important outcomes for the adaptive uh, design. That includes um, the probability of stopping for futility at the very first interim look. In this case, this probability is fairly high. It approaches 16%. The next probability is related to the second decision rule, uh, the rule for sample size um, uh, re-estimation. And we can see here that the probability of increasing the sample size based on the data available at the time of the second interim analysis uh, is relatively low. It's actually less than 20%. In this case, it's 18.3%, which is quite consistent with uh, this same characteristics of many other adaptive designs that support sample size re-estimation. And this is actually a direct consequence of the fact that this uh, adaptive design employs a an intelligent, quote-unquote, approach to 
sample size reestimation. The sample size will be increased only when it's truly beneficial, when it truly helps increase the probability of success. And in this case, we can see that it's, it's not going to happen um, all, all the time. It's actually going to happen less than 20% of the time. And the uh, bottom two rows present the probability of success for the uh, traditional design, a benchmark, as well as the proposed adaptive design. We can see here that the adaptive design provides a fairly small power advantage over the traditional design, uh, about two percentage points. Uh, but I guess what's even more important than that is that both designs are clearly underpowered because power is only about 70%. And this is mainly due to the fact that the probability of stopping for futility at the first interim analysis here is quite high. And here I would like to make uh, the following comment then how to potentially address this uh, issue of uh, underpowered designs. Because, as we said before, we rely on an iterative process when designing adaptive trials using simple simulation-based approaches. And I would recommend the following changes to the next batch of simulations. It will be very helpful to run additional simulations to examine the impact of the futility threshold on overall power in the trial and potentially use a lower futility threshold, perhaps lower it down to 5% for conditional power. Right now that threshold is set at 10% and that leads to a fairly high likelihood of stopping the study for futility, given that uh, the treatment is expected to be quite effective. So this is, uh, it's that probability of stopping of over 15% uh, is quite high. And by adjusting potentially this uh, threshold for conditional power at the first interim analysis will help the trial sponsor improve the probability of success in the trial. And now table 10 supports an informative comparison of the traditional and adaptive designs. How do we define, first of all, a traditional design here? It would be a design that supports futility stopping and this is done to facilitate a fair comparison, if you will, of the true trial designs. But in the traditional trial, the total sample size will be fixed. The traditional trial does not support sample size reestimation. And if we now perform a head-to-head -head comparison of the traditional and adaptive designs within, um, within the individual intervals that we can define at the time of the second interim analysis, we can define, first of all, an unfavorable interval. That's where conditional power at the second interim analysis is below the lower threshold of 50%. In that case, both traditional and adaptive designs would lead to the same probability of success, which is uh, extremely low. It's only 20%. That is because in this case, the adaptive design would not attempt to increase the sample size in the trial. And therefore, for all practical purposes, it will be equivalent to a traditional design. Now, if I may go down all the way to the bottom two rows in this table, we see a similar set of findings, conclusions, that if we focus on the outcomes at the final analysis, given that conditional power was in the favorable interval at the second interim, which means that conditional power was over 90%. In that case, both the traditional approach as well as the adaptive approach would lead to the same very high probability of success. It's almost 98%, 97.8% power. And the reason it is those, again, those two values are identical is because in this case, it is clear of conditional power at the second interim analysis is above 90%. The trial is clearly in good shape. There is no need to enroll additional, additional patients in the trial. What would be more interesting is to focus on rows uh, three and four in this table that shows us the probability of success in the trial conditional upon the underpowered outcome or promising outcome at the second interim analysis. In this case, the adaptive design would react to the fact that conditional power is lower than uh, expected. And uh, based on this finding, 
a, a recommendation would be made to the trial sponsor to increase the sample size up to the predefined cap. And because of this flexibility, the adaptive design would end up providing a substantial improvement over the traditional approach. Uh, this improvement uh, exceeds, uh, exceeds 10 percentage points. We can see here that with a traditional approach, within this un underpowered interval, we should only expect the probability of success slightly exceed 80%. It's uh, 81%. With the adaptive approach, with the option to potentially increase the sample size, power could be in improved again, conditional upon this particular set of outcomes at the second interim analysis, all the way up to about 91%, which is a great illustration of the main advantage of an adaptive approach to determining the sample size in a trial. In this case, the sample size is increased only when the results look sufficiently promising at an interim analysis. And we can see here, then we can realize a substantial gain, substantial power advantage over the traditional approach if we decide to pursue this adaptive, uh, uh, this, this, this particular type of uh, design adaptation at, uh, at an interim assessment. So now we're done with the discussion of this first class of adaptive designs. And these are the trial designs where interim efficacy data could be used to adjust the sample size or the target number of events with the ultimate goal of improving the probability of success in the trial. And in the next four parts, this will be parts uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10, I will present two other classes of popular adaptive designs. That would be designs that would help trial sponsors identify the best treatments or dosing regimens, as well as adaptive designs that support data-driven patient population selection. In, 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 in a trial. And I uh, would like to thank you for your interest in this online training program. I hope you will watch the other videos in this program and uh, that you would share information on this training program with your colleagues. Thank you very much.